Good morning to everyone, good afternoon, good evening. Um, this is Daniel Blank speaking. I'm the director of the Accounting Rules uh, Project and I wanted to give you a warm welcome uh, to our webinar series on tracking NDC achievement, uh, new, new accounting perspectives. This is the second webinar of our um, free series and today um, we want to talk about tracking um, NDC progress through policies and measures. Um, I therefore um, give you a warm welcome and uh, would like to introduce you uh, the two um, projects financed both by the ICLI, by the International Climate Initiative of the German Federal Ministry of Environment, Nature Protection, Building and Nuclear Safety. Um, the projects are the Accounting Rules Project for the Achievement of the Mitigation Goals of Non-Annex 1 countries, which is implemented uh, in Mexico, Costa Rica and Colombia. Um, together with the Partnership on Transparency in the Paris Agreement, uh, which is providing us the platform to, to run this, um, this webinar. Maybe some of you have participated in the first webinar uh, where we had an introduction by Mrs. Kirsten Orscholuk from the BMOB um, for the series. Um, I will afterwards give you a short uh, linkage um, to the first webinar and also to the third one. And um, before that, I would like um, um, to familiarize you with some, some technical details and um, then we can get started. So in the first webinar, um, we discussed about the general um, accounting guidance that is given by the Paris Agreement and uh, we, discuss we, we discussed um, how to frame NDC accounting. If you are interested in seeing the presentations and also in hearing the voice recording, you can refer to the um, Transparency Partnership where you should just uh, see the, the link on your, on your screens. Uh, today we will have the, the second webinar and um, by the end of July, probably in the last week of July, we'll, we will have a third webinar, a third session um, on the accounting for the um, agricultural, forestry and other land use uh, sector. Okay. Just let me um, introduce, so introduce you some uh, technical details. You will um, have the option to ask us questions whenever you want. Um, you would need to use the, the chat box which is on the left part and the left bottom part of your of your screen, of your server screen. Um, you can write us um, via the chat any question you want. Uh, please send it to all presenters only. Uh, you can select this um, in the recipients list, in the drop down list um, in order to, to not um, yeah, litter the, the chat box um, of all participants and then just click on send. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, um, to give you a short um, context uh, for, for this webinar. Last time um, we discussed um, a lot about uh, the general um, accounting principles uh, and you can see um, on this slide um, how accounting is linked with, with the overall NDC um, planning process and also with the global stock type. Um, GHG accounting in terms of the Paris Agreement is meant um, to, um, to monitor the NDC achievement at national level and this information um, again feeds back into the global stock take um, where the monitoring and, and the assessment is done whether all NDCs worldwide um, suffice to, to achieve the, the global temperature goal um, to remain or to stay below um, a global warming um, above below two degrees compared to pre-industrial uh, levels by the end of, um, of the current century. And um, countries used um, national um, 
mitigation potentials, um, criteria of fairness and ambition, criteria of responsibility and capability um, under the concept of the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective um, capabilities. Um, in order to uh, plan um, the NDCs and then to um, decide what the NDC mitigation contribution could be. And um, at the national level, this um, now needs to be implemented. And how is it implemented? Through policies and actions. And this is why um, today in this second webinar we want to discuss about how policies and actions um, can be used to, um, to monitor NDC progress and in how far this, uh, this is different or, or even also similar to NDC um, accounting. And uh, we will have three speakers um, that um, will give you technical inputs on, on this topic. Um, you can see on this next slide um, that um, from the Accounting Roots project we are working basically in four areas. One is on NDC accounting, another one is on the linkage of NDC accounting to uh, CTU, uh, to the clarity, transparency and understanding um, of the NDCs asked for under the enhanced transparency framework um, of the Paris Agreement. The third area is on the integration of accounting with existing instruments in the countries, um, basically with inventories, um, MRV elements, um, like um, institutional MRV structure, emission registries, um, MRV of mitigation actions of NAMAS, for example. Um, and also we have a, third, uh, a fourth area, sorry, which is on NDC implementation, uh, where we look at questions like harmonization with uh, the definition of sectors, um, sector targets and so on. Today we want to focus on the third part, um, the alignment with MRV and national inventories. And this is where we will have um, the presentations of, um, of, of my colleagues. Um, just before presenting you the, the first present, presenter, I wanted to um, um, recommend you to consult the Transparency Partnership uh, website. Uh, there, by the end of the week, you will find um, a first uh, presentation related to, to the last um, webinar, which is about the starting points for GHG accounting of developing countries under the Paris Agreement. Uh, there we discussed the um, accounting principles as they have been presented in the Paris Agreement and uh, discussing how far they, they can be translated um, into concrete um, um, rules and recommendations at the country level. By mid-August, uh, we want to have a, a other, another second presentation on inventoryability, uh, which is just uh, the topic that will be introduced now. Um, by our first speaker. Um, you can see this here on this agenda. Our first speaker will be Mrs. Verena Kreichen from our technical partner, the Öko Institute from Berlin in Germany. And uh, she will um, give an input on how to improve the reflection of mitigation on outcomes in the GHG inventory. And then afterwards, we will have a second presentation from Mr. David Rich um, from the World Resources Institute on tracking progress of policies and actions. And as a third presentation, Ma Mrs. Marion Fiebeck uh, will um, present on the linkages, linkages to bottom up inventories of mobile source emissions. Um, with this, I want to conclude. And I would give over, I would hand over to my colleague um, Verena Greichen. Um, she works, with, as I said, with the, um, with the Öko Institute. Um, she's there as a senior researcher. Uh, she's an expert in carbon markets and has extensive knowledge on the EU emissions trading scheme and on the aviation, aviation sector in terms of emissions. Uh, she also developed energy efficiency indicators and at the EU level collected and assessed mitigation actions of the member states. 
and currently she supports us in the Accounting Roots project in Costa Rica um, in the formulation of a national accounting system for Costa Rica and also did um, an application of the in in inventorability, sorry it's a hard word, inventorability um, exercise um, on some NAMAs um, in Costa Rica and um, she will certainly be happy to share, to share her experiences uh, with all of you. So with this I hand over, I wish you an interesting um, webinar and feel free to send okay. us your questions via the chat functions whenever you want. Thanks. Good morning everybody and thank you <coughs> Daniel for introducing me and for this opportunity to speak here at the webinar. I'm talking about inventoryability, so what's that? It's the effort to make sure that the effects of policies and measures are really reflected in the greenhouse gas inventory. And this becomes more key as more and more countries take over ambitious targets and um, may not have inventories um, that reflect those efforts. And that would be a shame, of course, because especially countries with uh, who really want to move along should also see the effects of their efforts. Um, currently in the project, um, I'm focusing on Costa Rica, so um, I will also talk about our, uh, a few examples from Costa Rica and the other countries we're working with um, currently in Latin America that are Mexico and Colombia. Oh, so that moved one too far. So what's the difficulty of, of quantifying um, measures? If you have a, a measure to, to improve your um, greenhouse gas efficiency, then normally it is very um, difficult to quantify the exact results because there are overlap with other policies, there are lots of other influence factors, and there might be cross effect to, to other sectors of the inventory. And um, therefore, adding up the emission reductions from all measures normally gives us a very different picture of looking on the inventory and see the, um, the summed up effects of all the measures and the other influence factors in the countries. So to measure whether the climate targets are reached or not, the inventory is the first place to go. That's the key um, part to measure the progress towards climate targets. But if this is the key um, position to measure where the climate targets are reached, of course, we have to make sure that the inventory really can reflect the efforts that has been done. So it is important to harmonize the methods used in the inventory and to also um, adopt them to the measure to like the measurement of the measures, so to say, um, to make sure that we follow the same methodologies. David later on is going to talk a bit more about um, the assessment of the measures, so I'm focusing here on the inventory part. So can the inventory replace the monitoring of measures? And normally, no, because um, if I have a measure and it might be very successful, we can still maybe not see the same effects in the inventory. So I take an example from Germany. I'm from Germany, so that's always a good starting point. And uh, it is about the renewable energy supporting scheme. So um, the share of renewable energies was um, enhanced greatly and the expectation was that then emissions from electricity generation should drop. But this might not be true if other factors intervene. So maybe if the electricity demand increases a lot, um, despite an increase of renewables, there might be um, a constant uh, share of emissions or what was the case in Germany, the rest of the electricity generation may change a lot and thus not reflect the enhancement of renewables. But the emissions may also decrease to other factors um, than the support scheme. For example, if we would 
implement emission standards for conventional generation or there might be price changes for um, either the fuels, so coal might get um, more expensive and natural gas cheaper, so that might um, shift the fuel mix, or maybe the technologies get cheaper. We've seen that with um, renewables a lot, that um, constructing renewables has gotten a lot cheaper than it was when those policies were decided and implemented. So normally inventories do not reflect single measures, except if there is a single technology driver and a uniform methodology. That's normally, especially in countries that have many sectors and many policies, um, that's seldom the case. But it might be in other countries that have not so many industrial sectors, for example, it might be easier to see that. So if we look at the German example, um, we have the renewable energy generation, and you see here, I'm not sure whether you can see my mouse, no you can't, the, the line that is down there, the dark blue one, shows the share of renewable energy in electricity consumption in Germany. So you see that there has been a huge increase over the last years, starting from 2000. And, um, but the emissions have not reflected that. So if you look at the emissions, and those are the upper light blue line, then you see that there is more and more coal in the remaining mix, and this is eating up a bit the effect of the renewables. But of course, if there wouldn't have been this renewable policy, emissions are expected to have increased in the past. So there has been an effect, but it has not led to a total decrease of emissions. But just to show an example how it is different, is um, NTO emissions from nitric acid production here from the EU as a whole. And there you can see that even though the production increased, that's the upper line, um, the dark blue one, emissions dropped and significantly. And this is because um, first NTO emissions from nitric acid where production were reduced with using JI projects and later it was introduced into the ETS and um, then it became economic to install catalysts and um, destroy the NTO. So we see here a massive impact of the climate policies that led to dropping emissions despite, um, despite the, the increase of production. So how can we make sure that the inventory reflects the effects of all policies and measures, or at least of all major policies and measures? The basic principle for inventories is emissions are always um, activity times emission factor. And depending on, on the level of accuracy, the IPCC has defined three tiers. And in tier one, you take national activity data and um, default emission factors from IPCC. In tier two, the national activity data is multiplied with national emission factors that of course have to be studied and updated regularly. And in tier three, the activity data is improved a lot. Um, it's bottom-up activity data for each source and there might even be source-specific emission factors or at least national emission factors. And whether or not our measure can be reflected in tier one already or only in tier two or three really depends on the measure and on the sector. And I will um, make some examples there because um, once the inventory is done, the general rule with IPCC is that the key source category, those with most emissions and those with most change in emissions, they should use the highest tier, whether the minor categories can use a lower tier. So if we want to check whether our inventory is reflecting the mitigation efforts in the country, um, we will have to look at the different inventory categories. And the start is to um, have a look whether the major category are using a high tier 
and then whether um, whether the measures we want to see reflected in the tree affect um, affect a sector with a, a high tier. So there's just to illustrate it a bit, how can it be that the measure is not reflected in the inventory? So one option is that the source is not covered at all in the inventory. So um, speaking about Costa Rica, as I told you, we're just working with them, is we found that they have, um, they have a lot of um, um, animals on meadows. And one mitigation action is to plant more trees on those meadows. It's like some meadows already have trees and others don't. So some additional trees um, can help drive emissions down. But those trees are not covered in the inventory. So even though you might plant a lot of trees, you will not see it in the inventory. And the other um, option, uh, the other example is from Germany. There were some project developers for JI projects saying we want to reduce methane from coal mines. And then the German authorities said, well, we don't have methane from coal mines because in our inventory these emissions are zero. And when they investigated it further, it turned out that there is that there are emissions from methane from coal mines, but they were not captured in inventory. So what they did is improved inventory, include that new source category, and then they could also give green light to the JR projects. Another um, might be that the activity data is based on different sources. And normally this is easy for energy, um, like standard fuels that are sold on the market and there are taxes and there are um, import charges and then normally we have very good data. But there are other sectors where the data, um, activity data is a lot more complex to come by. Maybe the composition of waste or the use of fertilizers, especially of natural ones. Um, and in those cases, it might be that at a measure level we have a bit we have better data quality than in the inventory and that we can use um, the insights from the policies in order to improve the inventory. I think Marion Fiebig is also talking about the, the cross um, fertilization of data collection of measures and inventories and how the measures can help us improve our inventory data sources. Then another um, case might be that the inventory uses default emission factors and those default emission factors cannot capture if the country is doing something to improve the emission factors. So one um, example are fugitive emissions for natural gas. So Colombia is considering doing their projects in order to, um, to have their gas network um, better close, reduce fugitive emissions, but as long as they use default emission factors, that this will not be shown in the inventory. So they need national emission factors in order to reflect that. The same is true, for example, for recycling of F-gases from aircon or from uh, fridges. If you recycle this, of course, you need a national emission factor that reflects that instead of the default emission factor from ICE. And then there might be that different methods are used at activity level and in the inventory. Um, we've seen also an example here in Costa Rica um, where in the cafe sector they're improving the, the carbon footprint and one measure is to reduce the, the biomass use for the um, cafe mills. But as this is biomass, and that biomass normally is not used for other purposes, but just um, uh, will then be biomass waste, re enhancing the energy efficiency helps a lot to increase the, the economic viability of the project, but it will not decrease the emissions in the inventory. This is also true if life cycle emissions are used at activity level. So um, that's very typical in transport, so to say. And there, uh, 
we have to compare that to the inventory, um, the logic of, of reflecting the national boundaries and also the sector boundaries. So what will be the steps to improve the inventory? So the first step is to identify the relevant categories. So look at the key source category in your inventory and um, see what tiers they use and whether the major policies and measures in that area will be reflected or not. Then have a look at your major policies and measures and see it, what inventory categories they will tackle and what, um, what uh, tiers are used there. Based on this, the inventory should be improved. This is in line with uh, customary improvement under IPACC and UNFCCC. So there should be an improvement plan in order to reflect those. And the third is streamline the reporting methodology for policies and measures and the inventory in order not to be talking about totally different types of reductions. So this was in brief my uh, introduction to inventoriability. As Daniel said, we're going to have publications on the issue, but we are still finalizing them. And um, now I'm open to questions. Mm. questions. Thanks a lot, Marion. Uh, thanks a lot, Verena, for your for your presentation. Um, we are inviting questions now. Um, if, there are, if there aren't any, we would continue with uh, Marion feedback. Um, but maybe we, we just wait some, some seconds to, to see if there are some comments or other questions. Um, as Verena also said, um, there will be a, pres um, a publication um, probably by, by August, end of August. Uh, which will have a lot more details. Um, I mean, it's always a trade-off between time and uh, degree of detail which you can have in, in those webinars. So if you're really interested in a topic, you are invited to uh, check on the um, website of the Transparency Partnership uh, within like six to eight weeks. And uh, you might find uh, this presentation and further details uh, there and you can ever uh, you can always come come back uh, towards us or also directly towards uh, Verena Greichen from, from the Öko Institute. Um, as I haven't received any questions so far um, in, the, in the chat function, um, I would uh, directly introduce you uh, with Marion Fiveck. Um, she will have the, the next presentation. Um, Marion Fiewek is an um, appreciated colleague um, who specializes in transparency, policy analysis, mitigation and uh, the link of all those topics with sustainable development. Uh, she has been following uh, UNFCCC negotiations for many years and, is, uh, transparency and its transparency provisions and options to enhance the level of ambition. Um, she also um, has led the Climate Action Tracker project, which you might uh, know from your experiences, and uh, also worked at the UNFCCC um, to support the technical analysis of biannual update reports. Um, Marion is also a member of the expert group on MRV of the uh, GIZ transfer project. Uh, where she um, analyzed the transport se sector and where we will also have the, the, the presentation on. Um, apart from that, she is a um, member of the technical working group for transformational change and transport of the ICAT. And uh, she will now present um, on how to improve the monitoring of um, emissions from mobile sources and um, how the national uh, GHG inventories and MOV um, elements can be used um, for these purposes. Uh, with this, I hand over to Marian and also give a warm welcome to her, to, to her on, in this webinar. Thanks, Marian. Thanks, Daniel, and welcome uh, also from my side to this webinar. Um, my presentation um, 
we'll go into more detail on one sector, um, in this case the transport sector and emissions from mobile sources and within the tracks project which is um, from uh, some colleagues of Daniel's um, who are working with a number of countries in the transport sector to improve um, uh, or to engage them into um, mitigation actions in the transport sector and in that um, context also work on transparency questions and um, data availability questions with d a number of countries. In the context of that project we started to ask ourselves um, coming from a different angle, very similar questions. Um, we were working on the MRV of uh, individual measures in the transport sector and we're asking the question how far can we make use of inventory data um, for the MRV, for the setting up of MRV systems of these measures. So a lot of um, Although we're coming from a slightly different um, starting question, I think that a lot of the issues that we find are very similar. Um, I'll very briefly um, go through uh, uh, some terminology issues that we came across, um, have a very, very brief um, outline of the um, inventory approach in the transport sector. Um, the issues around boundary questions that Im impact how far these two questions can be answered at the same time and then go into um, how you actually do uh, calculate MRV of mitigation actions and how you can then uh, use this uh, use inventory data um, for this purpose and that goes actually both ways so we'll talk about synergies and limitations. Um, with ter uh, in respect to terminology we found that um, there was a lot of confusion because the inventory system and the IPCC uses um, terms uh, of activity and emission factors slightly different than the people who are dealing with um, the MRV of mitigation actions in the sector. Um, for under the IPCC um, activity can mean very different things. Um, for tier one it means the fuel that's used for um, tier, sometimes tier two but certainly tier three it means in the transport sector the distance that's traveled so um, the type of activity data is actually changing depending on the tier. In the MRV of measures activity normally refers to um, the distance traveled. So if you're talking to someone who's designing mitigation actions and mention activity data, they will think of um, distance traveled either expressed as vehicle kilometers or passenger kilometers and ton kilometers. So that can quickly lead to confusion. Um, so it's important to be very clear on, on what you're talking about. Um, same we found with um, the use of top-down and bottom-up. Um, also here the um, IPCC guidelines basically define this um, based on the level of detail of the calculations that you're um, doing, whereas in the MRV of measures this is usually um, by type of activity data, uh, data that you're using. So. Um, if you're talking about um, distance traveled, this is a bottom-up approach. If you're talking about um, fuel consumed, you're talking about a top-down approach. So this can also lead to confusion very quickly and um, makes communication um, hard. So always important to be clear what you're talking about. Um, we then had a very uh, close look at um, 
the inventory um, for the sector and what kind of data is required in different tiers and Verena already mentioned that that the tier is, is very important in that respect because it um, requires different um, types of data which is reflected here in the different parameters but it also requires a different level of detail in disaggregation and um, we see um, a, an increase in level of dis disaggregation level of detail with the different tiers but we also see um, this change in the type of uh, data, so the actual parameters that you need to monitor. So, and that is, is very important when you're trying to match um, your MRV of measures and your um, inventory, because not uh, all all data is relevant for all kinds of measures. Um, we also looked at the differences between 1996 and 2006 guidelines um, as although non-Annex 1 countries are um, only required to use 1996 guidelines, a lot of countries are now starting to or have already started to use 2006 guidelines. So we wanted to know if this logic changes uh, when you're using the new guidelines. And the main difference is in, in the transport sector for between the two guidelines is um, that there is a change in t tier two methodology for the CO2 and some additional parameters and a higher level of disaggregation for the tier three for the bottom up. Um, in principle, that means th that means that there's no major change in its applicability and usability for the MRV of, of measures because it's uh, largely still the same um, type of data. Um, we then looked at um, what kinds of um, issues do we encounter in trying to match um, MRV of individual measures and the inventory and one clearly is the uh, geographic uh, scope. Um, the inventory obviously is, is of a national scope whereas um, particularly transport sector measures are often very local. They might be only a city, they might be a region, um, they might in some cases only be one um, bus line within a city. So um, it's, it's hard to um, match that re data requirement with the um, national level inventory. However, um, there is ways to uh, overcome that and we'll get to that with the limitations and synergies. But um, one uh, important aspect in this is that uh, even the national level inventory, particularly in the transport sector, is actually made from um, uh, surveys and data collection that is often um, representative uh, studies that are done and then extrapolated to the national level. So in the same way you can use that data to extrapolate to your regional data that your your measure is um, is is relevant for, and the other way around, you can obviously use um, data that you're collecting for that particular measure to help improve your inventory and extrapolate to the national level. Um, Verena already mentioned that there is obviously uh, an issue with um, the the scope. Um, of uh, the inventory. It has a clear um, coverage in only um, reflecting fuel combusted in mobile sources, uh, whereas for the um, MRV of measures, depending on the type of measure, a lot of other um, emissions might be relevant to actually see whether it has been successful or not. Um, in many cases that includes uh, fuel production, particularly where we have ele electric vehicles 
vehicles or electric forms of transport involved. Um, depending on the measure, it can also include vehicle production or scrap uh, scrapping, um, particularly relevant for uh, fleet renovation programs, for example. So here we need to be um, very careful um, to see where in the overall inventory the information that we might need for the MRVF measures can be found because not all of that is in the actual transport um, uh, part of the inventory. Um, for the MRV of individual um, transport um, measures, um, we have identified sort of a, a standard um, calculation um, mode. That's how normally uh, you would go about um, uh, figuring out your uh, the effect of your measure. Um, that can s change slightly um, for um, freight. Um, uh, measures. This is this is for um, for um, passenger transport, but uh, it's it's pretty standard. Uh, it's also been used for um, in the baseline and uh, monitoring compendium of the UNFCCC and the transport volume there. So um, we're starting with uh, the individual trips and then adding on what kinds of vehicles these trips are actually made in, um, how efficient these vehicles are in, in their fuel consumption and then what kind of fuel is used and that gives you the emissions. So we've used this logic to um, figure out for different kinds of measures what are the actual parameters that are uh, that the measure is trying to affect and then what kind of data and information would I need to measure whether it, that's been successful or not. Um, and then from that we've looked at how far can we use inventory data at which tier level to um, help us in that um, assessment and uh, here it's important and I think David will uh, also talk about that to distinguish between ex ante and ex post assessment if you're looking at um, the projection of uh, potential effects um, before you're starting or implementing your measure um, you have slightly different data requirements than when you're looking at the actual determination of um, achieved effects um, exposed. So for the example of the fuel efficiency standards, um, our main areas of uh, impact is uh, the number of vehicles um, per um, vehicle type and obviously the, the fuel efficiency of each uh, vehicle. And here we find that for ex ante um, assessments, we actually have most of the information within a bottom-up inventory that's at least a tier two um, inventory um, because here we have a, a split up by fleet uh, composition and we do have um, disaggregated um, data on, on fuel efficiency. Um, for exposed uh, assessment, we uh, find that these um, default values that we uh, may be able to use on fuel efficiency from the inventory may not be sufficient and we might actually need some um, actual collected data um, for that specific purpose. Um, we obviously have limitations in, in using um, the um, inventory data for the MRVF measures and I've uh, already mentioned some, some is the geographic scope, um, particularly for the ex post assessment where you really want to measure achieved effects um, and that is also due to the fact that with um, the um, inventory a lot of um, default values are, are usually used which, which are not useful for the ex post assessment. Um, we need to adjust the scope depending on the measures. Um, that is the case for um, not only electricity but also for 
biofuels um, very important because that um, is reflected in um, the agriculture and land use sector um, and normally we find that for exposed assessments um, the the level of detail is not enough um, in the inventory um, and we we need to collect additional information but there's having said that there's also a lot of synergies and as I mentioned before um, if, if I'm actually collecting data for um, the MRV of my particular measure that can feed into the national level um, and improve uh, the accuracy um, of the national inventory um, we can also use that if it's coordinated between a number of measures that are um, that are um, operational we can um, even use that to move towards higher tiers in the national inventory if we harmonize um, the data collection across different measures and then use that to scale up to the national level um, data collected for higher tier inventories um, as I said are very very useful for um, the ex ante assessment of um, potential impacts of measures and um, I think Verena already in indicated earlier um, to really maximize synergies we need to make sure that data definitions and collection methods are harmonized where possible frequency um, and timing of collection um, should be aligned so that data is available uh, for use um, at the time when I'm trying to prepare my inventory or when I, when I have to do my reporting on uh, measures and to, to do that it's useful to have data formats and calculation met methods um, consistent across different um, MRB systems or uh, different measures um, and to do that institutional cooperation um, being formalized helps a lot so that's um, been our thinking on how we can um, make use of um, information gathered in bottom-up inventories for the MRB of individual measures but in principle I would say most of that um, also goes the other way so that's it from me and happy to take any questions thanks a lot Marion for this uh, very interesting um, presentation um, may, maybe you could um, meanwhile um, I expect some some questions to uh, to be sent uh, to, to us uh, via the chat function um, explain us in how far you think that um, these lessons learned and in this um, experiences you have gathered um, can be generalized for for different countries um, or um, if generalization is difficult in how far um, um, a country analysis would be would be necessary to come to similar conclusions like you have presented um, the the exercise was done at a, a general level so we we didn't look at this um, only for a, a country so we um, started from the theoretical level so um, from our perspective um, applying that to a country and actually um, conducting a case study would be very very useful to um, uh, to find out where the, where the uh, devil is in the detail um, as you say um, and, and uh, what lessons we could draw from that uh, f further hands-on experience um, uh, problem here is a little bit in the transport sector that there is not many countries um, or non annex one countries um, that are actually using bottom-up uh, methodologies in the transport sector because it's quite data intensive um,
Okay, thanks a lot, Marion, for for this response. Um, I still haven't received um, any question, um, so maybe um, we can directly shift to the presentation um, of David Rich. Um, thanks again, Marion, for for this very um, interesting presentation, and and it, there was a lot of information and maybe also the the differentiation um, between ex ante, ex post, and and. And, and all the, the three different uh, deals um, in the transport sector, it's, um, it's a quite a lot. Um, it's quite a lot of information that has to be digested. Um, as I said in the beginning, you're also open to contact uh, via to get in touch with Marion via us or directly um, contact her. Um, um, and Daniel, thanks again. Daniel, yeah. Maybe I can add. Um, there is a paper going with this presentation, and that's available on the transfer website. So maybe you can share that with people as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So you you would then just um, have to go to the GIZ website and, and look for the transfer project, or probably you can could even find that uh, directly through um, the, the search machines. Uh, machines and um, if not just get in touch with us um, with this I would then um, ah, okay I've just received one question um, Marion which is um, I just will read it to you um, how do you think that methodologies can be aligned between GHG inventory guidelines and um, and the um, MOV methodologies you have presented. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I think the main issue is to align um, data definitions and um, in principle the the um, calculation methods being used are very similar or are the same. Um, what is different for um, the MRVF measures is obviously that you're um, not only looking at past developments and actual emissions but that you're also developing assumptions on baselines and um, projections. So you're using the same data but um, adding to that. Um, so for from my perspective making sure that um, you're using the same data with the same definitions and um, also using the same um, disaggregation and that is um, very important because there's very different ways you can disaggregate um, for example your vehicle fleet um, and to make sure that um, when you're um, when you're doing your um, original setup of the inventory that you're um, trying to capture uh, your, the realities in your country as, as well as possible um, and as detailed as possible to make it possible for individual measures to then reflect, uh, use that data. Um, for example, if um, uh, motorbikes are very important in, in many developing countries, um, it might be useful to actually already differentiate different types of um, motorbikes um, in your um, inventory so that you can use that um, depending on what kinds of measures you will have to reduce emissions from motorbikes. Um, in other countries, like de in developed countries, motorbikes are not that important, so that might not be necessary. So I think it try trying to um, find the right level of detail and the right um, level of disaggregation is disaggregation important. Is important. 
Thanks a lot, uh, Laura, um, for, for this question, and thanks a lot, Marion, for your answer. Um, I would now like to acquaint you with Mr. David Rich, um, who is a senior associate in the climate program at the World Resources Institute. Um, the World Resources Institute, um, as some of you might know, coordinates um, a transparency working group uh, within the NDC cluster and also has uh, elaborated several standards. Um, David uh, today will um, share with us um, his experiences uh, with the application and the use of the policy and action standard and some additional work he has been um, guiding at World Resources Institute. Um, he was strongly involved in the elaboration of the World Resources Institute's renowned policy and action standard uh, that is about assessing the impacts of policies and actions. And uh, with this short introduction, I would uh, like to directly hand over to, to David. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. And hello, everyone. Um, so uh, today I'll uh, touch on four topics here about tracking um, progress of NDC, uh, policies and actions within the context of NDCs. So one is a quick um, overview of the policy actions themselves in the NDCs, briefly. Um, purposes of tracking progress of policies and actions as distinct from um, national inventories and, and why they're both uh, useful things to do in combination. Um, third, um, approaches to tracking progress of policies and actions. Um, and lastly, the relationship of tracking policies and actions to greenhouse gas inventories, which we've already um, been hearing about uh, in previous conversations, presentations already. Um, so in terms of um, the NDCs themselves, um, um, most countries have put forward NDCs that are national greenhouse gas targets, um, whether they are uh, reductions of emissions relative to base year emissions or relative to baseline scenario emissions or relative to emissions intensity. Um, the vast majority of countries around the world have, have greenhouse gas reduction targets. Um, However, there are a subset, around 15, that have put forward a list of actions as their NDC without a, a target, without an economy-wide target. And some of these are a combination of individual actions to reduce emissions with sector targets like um, energy efficiency targets or renewable energy targets or forest sector targets. Um, so in the case of countries that have actions only, you would need to track progress of policies and actions in order to track progress toward the NDC itself in a very direct way. For all of the many other countries that have economy-wide targets, policy and action tracking is also quite important in terms of understanding how, how you're reaching progress toward the NDC in terms of are you on track or not based on what you're doing to achieve the NDC, even though the NDC itself would be tracked through the greenhouse gas, national greenhouse gas inventory. Um, so in either situation, um, countries benefit from tracking progress of policies and actions, whether it's a means toward an end or it's the thing itself that you've, that you've put forward in the NDC. And this is a map from our uh, website at kate.wri.org um, that maps all of the NDCs around the world and uh, you can sort and filter by what is the type of target or the sectors covered or the adaptation component or etc. Many different ways of organizing the map but this is um, looking at um, what I was just speaking about in terms of which countries have greenhouse gas targets um, versus which countries have actions in the absence of targets or some combination. So all the countries in blue have some economy-wide target and the countries in dark green have actions only without a target. So just to emphasize the point that most countries do have targets, in that case, tracking policies and actions is important to know um, how you're doing in terms of what you're implementing in order to reach the target. And in the other countries, it, it is the target itself or the commitment or contribution itself. Okay, and in terms of 
why you would track progress of policies and actions in either of those two scenarios I mentioned. You want to ensure actions are being implemented as planned. So even apart from the impacts or effects of the policy, you want to know that it's actually being carried out and implemented as planned. Track progress toward targeted outcomes in different sectors or for the country as a whole. Understand the extent to which actions taken to achieve the NDC have been effective in delivering the intended results and what additional progress is needed to achieve the NDC. Inform decision making on which policies to implement, enhance, continue, or discontinue. Um, reporting on progress of, of actions and um, meeting the Paris Agreement uh, transparency and accounting provisions and informing the global stock take. So these are some reasons why tracking um, policies and actions is a good thing to do. Now, in terms of how to do it, if you step back, um, there are, I would say, three overarching approaches to how to do this, each of which has sort of sub-methods, but these are kind of a high-level um, ways of thinking about tracking progress of policies and actions from a spectrum of simpler to more complex. Um, you could track implementation of actions. You could track indicators related to their impacts, or you could estimate the actual impacts in terms of greenhouse gas reductions and other sustainable development benefits. So um, it, it goes from simpler to more complex, and you can do one or more, or you can do all three. The most robust approach would be to do all of these things. So I'll go through each one separately. So first, in terms of tracking implementation of actions, this is an important thing to do to ensure that actions are being implemented as planned. And you can track progress of actions along a policy implementation process um, or continuum from planned to adopted to implemented. Um, and to do that, you can identify milestones for policy implementation and track progress of indicators related to each of these phases of implementation. So you could track financing of actions and whether um, how much money has been spent to implement and finance actions. Um, there might be licensing, permitting, or procurement steps that can be tracked to see how far along the implementation is going. Um, there may be information monitoring systems that are set up, compliance and enforcement procedures that are in place or any other local policy administrative activities to make sure policies are implemented. So these are the kinds of things you can track just to make sure that the policy is actually being implemented apart from whether it's having the desired outcomes. And um, for further reference, there's a link at the bottom of the screen with a WRI paper on the subject with a, with a link. And I'm hoping um, either this presentation will be shared or, or posted online so that you can have access to these references on, on these slides. Um, now, the second type of approach is to look at outcomes of, of policies. A simple way to do that is to track indicators related to impacts or outcomes. Um, and so this is, this is about understanding whether they're having the desired impacts. Um, and if you, if you look at indicators for different types of policies, it can be a relatively simple approach. So, it, for example, if it's a renewable energy policy, you can track statistics on electricity generation by source, you know, wind, solar, coal, natural gas, the share of renewables in the energy mix, the installed capacity by source. And you basically just track these, these statistics or indicators over time to see whether they're going in the right direction. Um, and there's further examples here. Um, if it's a public transit policy, passenger kilometers traveled by mode, like subway, bus, train, cars, taxi, etc. If it's a, a forestry policy, area of land restored, um, percent of area covered by forest, forest stock volume, etc. So these are things to track to see whether the indicators are moving in the right direction, which is quite easy and, and also quite useful. Um, the downside is they don't by themselves tell you whether a given policy is responsible for those changes. They could be changing for many different reasons, um, ongoing trends or, or other policies that you're looking at, but not a particular policy you might be interested in, in understanding the impact of. So it's, it's quite useful 
Um, but to really understand the impact of, uh, I'll skip over this slide. Um, okay, one, one more point on the indicators is you can, of course, look at SDG indicators um, alongside those that you might be tracking to understand emissions impacts. So um, just to mention and some references here of a lot of indicators you can define to track progress to the SDGs and climate impacts at the same time, which um, would be a recommended thing to do. But I'll move on to the next slide now. Um, to really understand whether a given policy has been um, effective, this comes to the policy and action standard, which was mentioned, which is a way of really understanding policy impact. Um, and to do this, um, well, first of all, you can do this either ex post, backward looking, or ex ante, forward looking. Um, it gives you an estimate of policy impacts that demonstrates whether the policy or action is having the desired impacts. And the, and the key here basically is you're looking relative to a baseline scenario to see whether um, things have improved relative to a baseline that represents what is most likely to occur in the absence of a policy that you're looking at. So there's a few basic steps on the screen. You identify all expected impacts that the policy might have, which could be a combination of positive and negative, intended and unintended. Collect the necessary data for a given policy. Define the baseline scenario. Um, define a policy scenario, which represents what you think will happen with the policy in place as opposed to without the policy in place, and subtract those two scenarios to estimate the impact. The, the figure just illustrates those two scenarios. Um, in this case, you can look at the impact on renewable energy of two policies in a baseline case and a policy scenario case, and the difference is the attribution of increased renewable energy due to a renewable energy policy that can then be converted into emission reductions um, by applying emission factors. And just to emphasize again that when you're doing this, you can look at various sustainable development impacts at the same time. So social, economic, environmental impacts um, alongside emission reductions to give you a fuller view of the um, impacts of policies. And to do this type of analysis, um, one available method is the policy and action standard, which is um, explains how to do this, and the link is on the screen. The website um, at this link um, has the standard, and as well it has e-learning courses, and both of those in Spanish, French, and English. Um, there's a calculation tool you can use on the website, and additional sector level guidance um, to complement the general standard. And one other method, um, upcoming resource for additional methods is the Initiative for Climate Action Transparency, or ICAT, which is currently developing new guidance um, consistent with the policy and action standards. So sector level greenhouse gas guidance for agriculture, forestry, buildings, renewable energy, and transport. Um, more detailed guidance on how to do sustainable development impacts at the same time as greenhouse gas impacts, transformation change guidance, um, and stakeholder participation and technical review. So these will be um, several new resources available this summer in draft form, um, which also are compatible with the Policy and Action Center for how to do this policy impact assessment. Um, and last, the last um, thing I wanted to mention as I wrap up, I know we're at the end of the session. Um, basically, greenhouse gas inventory accounting and policy and action level accounting are two distinct things. They're, they're, they're compatible and basically serve slightly different functions and should both be done to serve different purposes. We heard in previous presentations there are overlaps in data and methods, um, but they're not the same thing. So just to emphasize that um, they can be done in, in the most compatible and harmonized way possible, but they, they serve, they have different pros and cons basically, and the inventory is comprehensive, um, but doesn't explain why emissions are changing the policy level um, accounting does explain why things are changing, but is not a comprehensive account of national emissions. Um, to track progress toward an NDC at the national level, you, you should use the 
the inventory over time and track progress. And this is a simple illustration of how to do that in relation to base year emissions and in relation to target year emissions, which is the, the level of emissions you're aiming for in the target year. Um, there's a further reference here to the mitigation goal standard for how to do this type of accounting. Um, and I will skip to the end and just say that, that basically the, the recommended approach would be to combine these two approaches into an integrated um, target setting, policy design, and tracking cycle where you, you apply both approaches at multiple points in time from designing the target or NDC using the inventory, but also thinking about policy level impacts. You design policies and actions that can help you meet that target, which involves um, policy impacts. You then implement those actions, track progress at both the inventory level and the action level. And um, I'm, I'm going quickly here, but um, if you combine all these into a cycle and implement this over time, I think it's the most robust way to track progress and account over time. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're out of time, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David, for, for this presentation. And it's, I, I mean, a really um, exciting topic. Um, you mentioned especially these um, linkages between accounting at the policy and action level or the level of the national um, GIG inventories. And we actually have received uh, a question from um, Mr. Harald Winkler, which goes in, in, in this direction. And he asks if you, David, agree that under the Paris Agreement, only those uh, countries for whom actions are at the core of, of their um, NDCs, uh, those can be held accountable for the implementation of, um, of those actions. In a sense, yes. Uh, yes, I think so. In a kind of narrow way, I would say, because I think ultimately everyone would be held accountable to the implementation of actions which lead to the emissions outcomes which everyone has agreed to. So for all countries, actions are necessary um, to reach the targets or the, the contribution, um, uh, whether it's a, a target or an action. Um, but in a strict sense, I think that, that um, it, the method for, for holding, holding countries accountable in the case of countries with targets, the inventory, I would think, is the main way, um, the primary source of information for understanding have you met the target or not. Have you met the target? Um, whereas countries with, with actions at the core of the NDC, the inventory is not relevant to the, to the commitment and instead the, the actions are what's relevant. Okay, thanks a lot, David. We also have another question from um, Mr. Raul Salas. Um, he asks um, um, what you would suggest for those countries that have peaking um, NDC targets um, and then that want to use uh, the, the policy and action standard. Um, and also a second part of his question is um, in how far the, the standard can be used to, av to avoid uh, double counting. Okay, yes, double counting, very good question. Um, I mean, policies and actions overlap with each other. And so if you, if you assessed each one separately and added them all up, you would likely be you know, overcounting, possibly undercounting, um, but there'd be some overlap in the emissions impacts. So it is quite important to, especially within any given sector, you know, in the energy for, sector, for example, to really think about the relationship between policies and not just add them up to, and which would lead to overcounting of impacts. Um, there is guidance in the policy and action standard about how to do that, how to think about those relationships and overlaps and avoid those double counting issues. Um, Assuming that was the question. Um, um, yeah, now the, the, the peaking, mm -hmm. yeah, the okay. peaking targets. Um, so I would recommend the mitigation goal standard as a as a method for tracking progress toward peaking NDC targets. Uh, how to do the accounting for that? Um, because you would then be looking at the national inventory and looking at when does the emission, uh, the national emissions peak and decline over time based on the inventory. In that case, the policy and action standard, again, helps you understand how to reduce emit, how to understand the 
you know, the impacts of policies taken to reduce emissions, but that the big picture level, you would use the emissions, um, the national inventory in combination with the mitigation goal standard, which um, explains how to do accounting for NDCs. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks a lot, Varena, Marion, David, for your very interesting presentations. Um, I hope that all participants um, enjoyed and learned something new about um, the linkages between um, the policy and action level and the um, NDC accounting level. Um, you're free to consult uh, the Transparency Partnership website where you will find information um, on the partnership itself, um, on the foreseen um, country or regional meetings uh, where the Accounting Roots project is happy to provide some, some inputs um, on, the, on the results of the project as well or uh, just to look for the publications uh, that will be made um, available or have already uh, been made available. Um, if you have any concrete questions, you can also use the um, general email um, account webinner.ndc.accounting at giz.de, which we just opened for the purpose of this um, webinar series. Um, sorry for the delay. Um, thanks again for all. Uh, participants um, to be here and, and all presenters uh, for their very useful inputs. Uh, thanks a lot. Nice day or nice evening. Bye.